Greetings, chemistry students. I hope that your uh, lesson on titrations went well. I realized there was, for some of you, some confusion about how to read a burette. So I do want to kind of go over that real quick. If you look at a burette, up at the top is the number zero. And down at, near the bottom is the lower limit mark, which on um, the burettes we're going to be using is going to be 50 milliliters. So as you dispense liquid through the burette, as the liquid goes down through the burette, the reading on the burette itself will actually increase as the liquid level drops, the number goes up. So if you know where you started, for instance, let's say that you started at five milliliters and you ended down here at say, 30, let's say you ended down here at 32 milliliters. Well, then the difference that you used is going to be 32 minus 5 or 27 milliliters. But if you start at the zero point at the very top, then whatever the reading is on the burette is, that's how much volume you've actually used. So in today's lesson, we're going to look at three types of chemical reactions, and then we're going to discuss two of those types in, well, the first in a little bit of detail, and the second one in a tremendous amount of detail. So there are three types of chemical reactions. The first type is a precipitation reaction, where you form a precipitate. Then there is an oxidation reduction or redox reaction. And then we have acid-base reactions. So the first one, precipitation reactions, that involves mixing ions in an aqueous solution to produce an insoluble or sparingly soluble ionic compound that precipitates out. And if you'll remember our basic solubility rule that you need to know is if it's sodium, potassium, ammonium, or nitrate, it's soluble or definitely not a precipitate. And for net ionic equate uh, for precipitation reactions, you should also be able to write a net ionic equation for those reactions. So precipitation reactions are what we've been dealing with already with quite a few of these stoichiometry problems and net ionic equations that we've been working with. For the next type, for redox reactions, first of all, we need to discuss oxidation numbers in more detail. So first of all, an oxidation number is the charge on an atom when it's in a compound. Now, for binary ionic compounds, that means if we just got two things in the compound, two elements, we can just use our tricks from the periodic table. Like if it's in group one, it's plus one, group two is plus two, then uh, the halogens are minus one, and group 16 is minus 2, and group 15 is probably minus 3. And so you can figure out what the charges of everything are. For instance, if I give you a very simple case of something like O F E C L 3, well, we know that chlorine is a minus 1, and we have three of them, so iron is a plus 3 because the total charge is 0. So that's a real simple one there. So some things to know for determining oxidation numbers. If you have an element that's just by itself, its oxidation number is zero. So if you just have solid potassium or solid aluminum, or if you have oxygen gas as an O2 molecule, it's just that one element. The charge on the element is zero. Now, the reason we're doing this is because in a redox reaction or oxidation reduction reaction, as you'll soon see, charges or oxidation numbers will change, and we've got to keep track of that. Uh, oxygen usually has an oxidation number of negative 2, but in H2O2 and other peroxides, it's negative 1. And a peroxide is going to be something with anything in group 1, including hydrogen, combined with oxygen, and it goes in a two to two ratio like that, typically. All right. Hydrogen is a plus one, except if it's bonded to metals in binary compounds. In those cases, it's negative one, because as you'll soon see, 
a distinguishing factor of metals. Metals, if you'll remember, they lose electrons and form cations. So metals have positive charges. So if hydrogen is bonded to a metal, then hydrogen has to take on the negative charge because metal has the positive charge. Uh, next, a group one metal, that would be your alkali metals. They're always a positive one charge. Your group two metals, your alkali and earth metals are always a positive two. And fluorine is always a negative one charge. There's no exceptions to those rules. Unless, of course, it's we have to go back to our very first rule that if we have a group one metal or fluorine by itself, we're dealing with fluorine gas, it's charge is zero. But in compounds, group one metals plus one, group two metals plus two, fluorine minus one. Then the total charge of all the atoms in a molecule or an ion equals the charge on the molecule or ion. So if we're dealing with just a molecule that doesn't have any charge, then all of the individual oxidation numbers must add up to zero. So we're going to consider this one. If we want to find the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in hydrogen carbonate. Now what you may not be able to see is that there is a negative sign right there. That means negative one. So the total charge has to equal negative one. Now, since this is not a peroxide, that means that oxygen's charge is negative two, and we have three of them. So that means the total charge from oxygen is negative six. Hydrogen is gonna be a plus one because it's not bonded to a metal in a binary compound. There's no metals in this compound. So we've got negative six and positive one. So our total charge is negative five without considering carbon. So we're ultimately solving that negative five plus what equals our total charge, which is negative one. And that answer would be four. So carbon is a positive four. And when you're talking about oxidation numbers, it is absolutely essential that you specify whether the charge is positive or negative. You don't want to leave any ambiguity whatsoever. You want to specify the positives versus the negatives. So if we check this out, oxygen is negative two, hydrogen is plus one. So if we have three negative twos and a positive one, then carbon is plus four. Right? So we're going to take a look at a few more examples. If we have this Na2O2, we know that sodium, because it's in group one, has to be a positive one. And if we've got two sodiums and two oxygens, we've got two positive ones, so our two oxygens must be negative one, because the total charge equals zero. In KClO4, potassium has to be a plus one. And then oxygen is usually a negative two. So if we've got four negative twos, that's negative eight, and potassium's a plus one. So since the whole thing needs to equal zero, chlorine must be a plus seven. All right, then let's consider this copper to nitrate. Now it would help if you know or remember that nitrate has a negative one charge. So if we have two nitrates at negative one, copper is a positive two. In fact, we would call this compound copper two nitrate because the charge of copper is positive two. Now for the nitrate, oxygen is usually negative two and we've got six of them or three oxygen, so that's negative six. So what plus negative six is negative one? Well, nitrogen is positive five. And in fact, in all nitrates, nitrogen is a positive five and oxygen is a negative two. So that's a way that you can assign charges. So what the heck does all of this have to do with anything? Well, we're going to be talking about electron transfer reactions. This is where electrons move 
from one species to another in a reaction. They're called oxidation reduction or redox reactions. Uh, as we will see in unit nine, you can generate electricity from them or you can cause them to happen by adding electricity to them, but not, but you don't always generate electricity. It all depends on how you set the reaction up. And that will be a great topic of discussion in unit nine. So sometimes we call this field electrochemistry and we'll get into that in much more detail later. There's some terminology you need to know. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. So when something is oxidized, it loses electrons. And if you keep in mind that electrons are negative, the charge becomes more positive. Reduction is the gain of electrons and your charge is reduced or your charge becomes more negative. So in oxidation, you become more positive. In reduction, you become more negative. Do not say that a charge increases or decreases because if you go from negative two to negative three, has your charge increased or decreased? That could be ambiguous depending on your perspective, but it is definitely if you go from negative two to negative three, you have become more negative. And so that is reduction. Have this little mnemonic device, oil rig, oxidation is losing electrons, reduction is gaining electrons. Right? So a quick review, oxidation is losing electrons, you become more positive, reduction is gaining electrons, you become more negative. So we have the oil rig. Right? Now, you can't have one of them without the other. If something is losing electrons, something else has to gain electrons. We don't do electron do reactions where electrons just go flying off into outer space. So both of them happen simultaneously. In other words, you can't have two oxidations or two reductions. You have to have one of each. Right? So for balancing redox reactions, um, you, you'll need to be able to write half reactions. And a half reaction is just half of the reaction, as the name implies. And then you balance everything, and then you balance all the elements, then you balance the charge by adding electrons, and then you have succeeded. So let's take a look at a simple example. They don't get too complicated with this whole process. But the first thing we need to do in this reaction is we need to assign charges to everything in it. So this one is nothing complicated. We can just use all of our tricks from the periodic table. And we also need to remember that magnesium by itself has a charge of zero. Iron by itself has a charge of zero. Chlorine would be negative one and iron is positive three. Magnesium is plus two and chlorine is negative one. All right. So the two half reactions, we have iron with a plus three charge turning into just plain old iron with no charge. Now to do that, to go from positive three to zero, it is gaining three electrons. So this is a reduction half reaction. Then magnesium, it's going from no charge to magnesium with a plus two charge. And to do that, it is losing two electrons. So we are producing two electrons as a product. They're being lost. That is an oxidation half reaction. Now, since this first one up here is, since the first half reaction is gaining three electrons and the second one is losing two, we need to get our electrons equal, which would be six electrons. So this one we would multiply by two. This one we would multiply by three. So we're gonna need a three and a three and a two and a two in our overall reaction. And lo and behold, 
It also balances it the same way we would balance a traditional reaction. The key thing here is you would need to be able to identify or write a half reaction. So these are half reactions and you should be able to write 